Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Christian Guru Murphy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week is a chronicler of our time. She's multi-award winning, very, very funny. Every week at Channel 4 News, somebody or other says, I wish we could get Marina Hyde on. Um, but she doesn't really do a lot of TV and radio. Um, and I'm delighted to say that she's sort of put her columns into a book called What Just Happened. And that's why we've got you on. It is indeed. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm most honoured. Well, I mean, I'm very surprised that you, 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 you've actually sort of um, come to do an interview about it all, because you don't normally. Well, it's, I'm, I'm very unfashionable in that I just think I'm a writer and that is it. And so I don't really do any broadcast things, but I'm making a, a, a very honoured exception for my book, um, and, and because I think that's probably fair to the publishers. So I, it, it is, it, it's an exception, but it's a delightful one. Now, I, I read your columns every week, obviously, um, and, you know, for a day, Twitter will be full of, did you see what Marina Hyde said? <laughs> did you see Marina Hyde's line about X? But putting them all together over sort of five years of politics, it's quite traumatic. It, it, it's, re <laughs> it's really actually put, you know, and also these things appear. I remember when we were, you know, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking, God, when I was putting it all together, I was thinking, you, they sort of appear once or twice, they, t twice a week. And just the sort of relentless onslaught of how, but the story just gets worse. You know, I, I, I had to think of somewhere to start it. So um, I decided to sort of put a pin in just a week, but a week or so before the referendum, just after the murder of Joe Cox. Um, I really feel like that's the moment where we kind of passed almost perhaps irrevocably, certainly we're not out of it yet, into that sort of dark timeline. And um, after, and I remember when I was writing a lot after Brexit, somebody said to me, oh gosh, you know, this is such fun, but what will you do in a year when it's all done? And I said, <laughs> God, I mean, even that, I thought, I don't think it will be all done in a year, but even I could not have predicted that six years in, we would be trying to unpick what deal we have and that things would have become more and more crazy and chaotic by the year. It's a clever place to start, though, because it takes you right into that, that very, very serious moment, as you say, after the death of Joe Cox. I remember it really well because I interviewed Farage um, yeah. that, that day, and, and that's the column that you begin with. Um, and, I mean, is that deliberate? Because you're known as hilarious Marina Hyde, that you kind of started with something that actually reminds us how very serious... I did what, want to start with something that is. reminded people of the stakes and the realities and, you know, in so many ways, the absolute grim unpleasantness of the last few years. Um, so I thought that was a sort of good moment on the eve of it all, um, when, you know, in people's heads, it could still have gone either way. Um, and another reason I started it then, I suppose, is because perhaps to some extent, um, I'd written earlier, I'd written, I'd... I'd f the sort of first thing I really felt I'd found my voice with was a sort of com a column about celebrities called Lost in Showbiz in The Guardian, which we didn't really properly cover celebrities before then. And I just said, I finally persuaded the editor at the time to let me be able to write about them. And I kind of found my voice in that. And then I also found my voice in a sports column in a different way, but I never really particularly, I don't think properly found my voice writing about politics. Maybe I just copied other people or I tried to do it in a... I, more derivative way or something I just but I felt in those weeks of Brexit and the, the, the referendum and just after I somehow found a new type of voice of writing about it and so I think that in some ways the better things I've written about have been since then um there's something about that event which was so kind of extremely emotional for people on both sides of the debate um and you know there were lots of people in my family who voted the other way um but it was sort of emotional and I don't know, something about that, I kind of wrote my way through it and I've, I found a better voice to write about things that, that just the things I had written about before just weren't as good as that. Did you care about Brexit very deeply? I mean, I think your second column says, it turns out Brexit was a zero sum game. And I thought that captured that moment after the Brexit vote really, really well because Yes, it was fascinating. There were winners and losers. Yes, I, yes, and actually it was extraordinary to see some of the people, you know, I remember s someone like Calvin McKenzie, the former editor of The Sun, 
went on the Today programme about a week after the vote saying, oh, I've got buyer's remorse, I voted leave and now I wish I hadn't, I don't know what I've done, which coming from him, who doesn't you know, have a whole lot of remorse about a whole lot of things, I thought was extraordinary. And um, yeah, it, it really mattered and it, 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 it it became, you know, we the dividing lines, that sort of that central value, it became the central value divide, I suppose, of UK politics. People, what side you were on that, you know, people identified far more clearly with leave or remain than even if they were a kind of long time Labour voting family um, or a long time, you know, they, they voted with, they identified much more strongly with um, how they voted there. And I suppose in some ways it was a it became a type of identity politics. And do you think we still are trapped there? And if so, how do we escape this man? God, I, if, you, if you know the way out, Christian, <laughs> you've got to tell me. I'm here to ask you. How do we escape? I don't know. Yeah, it, we're still very divided, aren't we? And, um, yeah, we're still divided. But I actually... I think people are so fed up now that I think um, that people on, on the ground level are trying to come together and make something uh, and realize you have to move past those divisions unfortunately we're in such a, ser a series of sort of crises where the fundamentals are such that only our overlords can make these decisions for you know whether it's the nhs or cost of living um these are kind of things that really it really we need politicians to kind of put things put the kind of i don't know that kind of identity politics behind and and really try and govern in the national interest of everybody and not just go for those easy kind of cultural wins which are just not helping anybody, I don't think. But do you really think, you know, enough is enough? Because in a way, that's kind of like the thread through your columns for years. You know, sort of, it, it can't possibly get any worse, can it? Um, yeah, I mean, it can. <laughs> no, I don't feel that it's going... I don't feel that it's going to happen, but I do think that when, you know, you hear about all these incredible charity initiatives that are just scaling up all the time to deal with these things. And I really think that's from the ground up and it's incredible. But I look up and think, what are politicians doing to help people? And what are they doing to put those divisions behind? And actually, I think that they keep going for these easy wins um, in terms of culture wars or whatever it is. And it's just really non-constructive. I think ordinary people are doing much more constructive things to overcome the divisions within their own families, whatever, you know, we all argue about it in my family. We did, there was all sorts of things, but everyone has to get along ultimately um, and try and make something out of what has happened. Not, I'm not just talking about Brexit, by the way, I'm talking about all the things, the pandemic, everything. I mean, I think people are really acutely conscious of the fact that the machine is kind of falling apart and that we need to mend it somehow. Is the tone of your columns, you know, who, who you are, you know, it, and, and I suppose I should just project onto that what I think it is, which is... You know, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. Yeah. And aren't they all utterly useless? I don't mean to totally undermine them, <laughs> say they're all utterly useless, but I do think we've just got an unbelievably bad crop of politicians and to deal with much more serious things than people have had to deal with in decades. Um, but, yes, I do think that if you you ought to try and ha laugh, I mean, I, I suppose that's how I respond to things in my own life, is to just try and remember to laugh about it um but i've always i've tried over the last few years to try and be a sort of friend to the reader who i think you know as i say on both sides people just were throwing their hands up saying what well, how how is this still happening what how have they not sorted this out how can the problems keep getting worse and i guess i've always just wanted to try and be a sort of friend to the reader and say hey yeah i also agree with you you know, and it's quite cathartic for me to write about it. Just writing about it at all is quite cathartic. I do think if you write this stuff down, it helps. So I don't have unresolved news issues, as many people in this country do. But to try and make people laugh about a an experience that is various degrees of awful is something that I try to do. But the, the way you make people laugh, I think, and it's, it's unique to your column, and I think that's why people sort of love it so much, is... The ability in a line or a phrase or even a word to just capture that <laughs> you're very kind that moment you know whether uh, uh, the one that keeps coming to mind which is sort of inappropriate but um <laughs> they, is, many of them are is, is shagatha christie <laughs> yeah. which is just it kind just... of like is the reference to boris johnson while we were going through the wagatha christie moment um of the trial um you are kind of, I think that's a bit of a flip one, but you know, yeah, it does. I, it's just, you know, like the it's just one what's I know, in the ether. It's mind. what's in the ether. And I, you know, I write them all on the day and 
I don't have anything stored up, sadly. I always wish I had... It just comes out. I just do it all on the morning. Um, And, you know, I am done and dusted by... Try and be done and dusted by midday. So how how do you write your column? You just you literally just sit down and start writing. Yeah, I get up early. Um, I start. I get. I'm at, always at my desk at about five. Um, but I have. That's partly that's because I'm doing other projects as well. But I, I sit a, um, and I sit there and I just think what what shall I do today? And then I write it all in one go. Um, and yeah, try not to. Because because you're quite often angry with whoever's in charge. Hancock or Boris I try Johnson to be angry at a, dis- at a sort of amused distance. I think yes. if you let the actual anger in, someone gave me some good advice on that once. They said, just keep the actual anger out. You can use it about, about, there are a few columns in there in which you can tell I'm sort of actually angry, but if you use it sparingly, I think it works. Otherwise, I do think people feel they're being hectored and shouted at. So there are some columnists who I really agree with the substance of what they're saying, but I just slightly feel I'm getting shouted at. And I think that the tone, as I've got older, I do think that tone is kind of the most important thing of all in writing. You can have absolutely nothing to say, but if you get the right tone and say it in an okay way, then people can think it's, people can massively overrate it weirdly. But if you have something really important, great to say, but you somehow get the tone wrong, it can go totally wrong. And it, you know, that's sort of unfair really, because it should be more about substance, but I'm afraid that style also is a big part of it. And do, and do you think you talked about being read by people who don't share your political sensibilities. Are you aware of being read by people who don't share your sensibilities? There's awful lots of funny people write and say that they they read and hit and enjoy it. Occasionally, even if they've been on the wrong end of a joke, but... um, So it's funny, I mean, I just... If you put in Marina Hyde best lines into Twitter... Oh, God. The top three search results, which I just did before we started, are Dorian Linsky, John Sopel and Fraser Nelson. Which is not a bad spread, I would say. That, yes. How? Wh- well, there you go. I... <laughs> of people all quoting your funniest lines. Oh God. Lines, isn't it? Okay. Right. Well, that's very kind of all of them. But. <laughs> but, uh, and, but do people contact you? I mean, do you get a lot of feedback? Yeah, I like the ones who write to me from you know somewhere in Indiana and say, you know, I never miss one. I don't know a- anyone is. <laughs> how? So how? How part of the sort of um, political journalism? Elite and pack are you? You know, do you oh lunch politicians? No. Do you hang out with no the press pack? I know? don't do any of that. You see, I'm like, an, you know, I just watch it at home on the telly with the same as same as everyone else. That maybe makes it feel a bit more accessible. And I, every now and then, I do do something crazy like go to a party conference, but and so that's a form of access that you wouldn't have if you were not just anyone else who isn't remotely involved in the media just watching on telly at home. But in general, I write from that perspective. Um, of just what you can see. I, I, I don't do that sort of insider stuff. There was this, there was this great um, Guardian writer from the dim and distant past called Neville Cardus who said he never wanted to meet politicians because it would dilute the purity of his hatred. And I do think that it is very difficult if you are friends with these people or you see them socially all the time to... I know I would self-censor just from a sort of, you know, frightfully nice British, like, oh, dear, I've met them at something. I think I'd better sort of pull my punch Not there. Not mean about I, I just yeah. find it... Not completely, but just a little bit, and I just think it's just inconvenient. You know, also, I think a lot of them are just horrendous people, mainly. You wrote about this, and I picked out a quote, actually. You said, um, getting too close to politicians on either side of politics is always a mistake for journalists. You might think the access makes them a great contact, but the compromises and self-editing required to retain them means that ends up being just a lie you tell yourself. Yeah, I think that there are some people, particularly with um, the Johnson administration, who have very, very close contacts within the administration. But have they reported fairly on... You know, I know it gives you great access and you get great stories because they're feeding you stuff, but I don't think they've reported fairly on it in general. And I think that's really important. And it's unless you're saying what your access is, it's, it's rather... You know, how can you believe any of it? I just don't think it's at all... It's, I just don't think it's at all clear. You know, I just never really wanted to be involved in anything like that, and it, I wouldn't choose it at all for myself. And, you know, I think you have an obligation to sort of, I don't know, to do some book about it afterwards. I mean, what, what about, I mean, your, your, your politics and your bias? I mean, sort of, how important is that to what you do, the fact that you write in The Guardian? I try not to sort of have particular politics about any of it, really. I mean, if I was doing the sketch writer's job, you're just writing about whoever's in power. I mean, I wrote a lot about the Blair government when 
and the Brown government when they were in power. And if it turned to Labour, I'd be writing about them every single week. The Tories would be the sort of distant sideshow who get it once every, you know, get coverage, as it were, just far less, as is the nature of all political coverage. The fact is that the Conservatives have been in power for the last however long it is, 456 years, I believe. So, um, you know, it's mainly going to be focused so on what they've the done. Yeah. But yeah, because I'm not really, you know, sometimes it does feel like a sort of little sideshow what's going along over the road. Can you imagine being as vicious to a Labour government? Yes, I mean, I think I wrote, I was quite rude about Tony Blair and yeah. Gordon Brown's government while they were happening, so yes. Yeah, because... Well, cause well, I what a relief up. to have a change of characters, Christian. <laughs> yeah. I mean... You know, no one more than me wants to stop writing about Jacob Rees-Mogg. Yeah. But he keeps repeating on us. See, about a year ago, you wrote, Keir Starmer remains the sort of person things happen to, a yes. reactor to events rather than someone who might have the potential to shape them. He feels like the inveterate advocate who waits for others to be judge and jury. Do you still think that? Yes, I do, I'm afraid to say. Uh, there's, a, there's a great Spanish football writer called Diego Torres who, um, who uh, sort of codified the rules of... Jose Mourinho's type of football. You know, they once... Mourinho's side... Well, a side he managed once advanced to the Champions League with only... Final, with only 19% of a possession. So, he, the sort of level of risk aversion... And he... Code, anyway, Diego Torres codifies this thing saying, you know... Which he basically shows how Mourinho thought himself into the position where even having the ball is a risk. Therefore, anyone who doesn't have the ball is stronger. And I slightly feel with Starmer, you know, I absolutely believe he could be watch his opponent double fought him all the way into number 10. But, I mean, it's a little bit like standing at Wimbledon when, you know, your opponent is double faulted all the way through and you're like, oh, my God, I'm holding the trophy. I can't believe it. But, yes, I think he's a highly risk-averse person. And I don't know if you can change that. I don't think people change in general is one of my theories on life. I don't think people change. I think they become more exaggerated versions of themselves and they can deal with things a little bit. But I don't think that you stop being risk-averse suddenly. So I think he will is a, a very risk-averse person. Do you think he'll be Prime Minister? Oh, God, I hate making predictions. I'm against all predictions. Um, I don't... Yeah, he, as I say, he could definitely be. I don't know whether he will be or not. I have no idea. And I, I'm kind of against... A huge amount of journalism has now become about kind of... Predicting, what do you, what do you think predicting events yeah. as opposed to reporting on them, which I think is really odd. And, you know, enough has happened that kind of informed analysis of what has just happened would be quite helpful, perhaps more than speculating, you know, what thing, how this might play out. I, I, I find that quite odd. I, I think it's quite an odd situation for the journalism to have got itself in. And, and in my mind, it's happened more and more and more. You know, journalists are always giving us their predictions for this or that. Who cares? Just don't... don't you've got lots of access. But it's usually wrong, anyway. So, it's always... Yeah. I mean, so the amount of times over the Boris Johnson's, I don't know, last two years, you know, he was completely written off, then he went to hospital in the pandemic, everyone's like, he's in, then it's 10 years, then he's out again, then... You know, this is just, like, some mad noise. You know, I'm, I am with Dominic Cummings on things like this, that it's just this mad noise that happens all the time. No, I mean, that, that's what's really interesting about you know, this book, because it, it reminds us what happened. Yes. Um, and, it, and it gives us an opportunity to work out what, what we think about it. Yeah, I mean, I, there were huge amounts that I couldn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> when I was going through selecting things, I was like, what were these things? It was so odd. And yet people were transfixed by them. Um, I said in the introduction to this book, which is such a weird moment, I went to... A friend of mine was doing a comedy tour and one of his very early dates was in Worcester. And I went up to Worcester and I stayed in sort of arrived and stayed in this hotel and down in the bottom was a sort of all bar one type place. And I went down to the bar at three o'clock to sort of wait before I went over to the theatre to see my friend's show. And the, t the bar was quite full, lots of groups of twos, ones, threes, people having a drink, absolutely glued to the screen. They were watching the Supreme Court hearing on the proroguing of Parliament. Mm. And I was like, what has happened to this country? Something very strange and very wrong has happened to this country. It was three o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon. This was crazy. People were watching these things in the evening. And I don't know, I mean, I, I used to have to... My children could do sort of... Because I had to keep watching these votes. Could do John Burko impressions. And I was thinking, this is awful. I feel, this, you know, that your years without this was so precious. Because what, what you said is that, that this is politics as reality TV. Yeah, I do think that. I do think that the kind of crazy cycles of reality TV that people... It, it, that was the dominant kind of cultural form of the early 2000s. And it's no coincidence to me that the biggest reality star of that era 
was Donald Trump. And he, he couldn't have become president without having, you know, run the US version of The Apprentice and becoming a figure in the American popular imagination that he certainly hadn't been since the like early 90s. And I do think that, you know, that Simon Cowell thing, the constant voting on everything, people at personal cause voting for these things all the time. Cowell actually dreamed of a referendum type TV show, he said. He, don't forget his vote was courted ridiculously by Cameron and, and by Gordon Brown. They were sort of desperate for him to sort of anoint them as well. And he had this idea that, you know, the British public would be able to vote on all the big issues, not leaving it to politicians. And Downing Street would merely be given a red phone in the middle of the studio to ring in and give their view if they were, you know, we live in it. <laughs> we live in it now. But, but I suppose what that's also done is change the way politicians behave, hasn't it? In the, yeah. in the well, that politicians reality these TV days stars. just don't do what you're supposed to do no. anymore. I mean, you've got them all freelancing. It's like the Wild West out there. If you look at sort of someone like Nadine Doris, who actually went, sort of left Parliament for a few weeks to go and eat some form of, you know, bush tucker genitalia, whatever they do, down in the Australian dungle on I'm a Celebrity. And now, she, you know, if you look at her sort of Twitter account, this kind of stuff she says... She's what would be described in the old days as sort of out of control. She's freelancing. She's saying things that... And there's no real sort of discipline. When you think back to the... Which, by the way, I also thought was terrible during the Blair years, the absolute message discipline. They all had their little pages. And, you know, whatever Peter Mandelson or Alistair Campbell told them to think, they had to just say out loud and just be like sort of droids on the news. Now you've got people saying all these... Crazy, I'm sort of becoming stars and kind of weirdo pers reality personalities in their own right. And you look at what happened in the years after the Brexit vote, and, you know, you heard these people, like, sort of... No one knew who... No one knew who any backbenchers were. Suddenly, you're like, oh, Marc Francois, you know, Steve Baker. These people were... I saw Steve Baker go on the news and say, you know, I've been called Brexit hard man Steve Baker. And I was like, my God, I mean, you know, you're the Wickham MP. Well, this never happened before. It was cra You know, it was absolutely crazy. And they became... Pers they were on TV more than anyone else. They were on TV more than Holly Willoughby. Well, they are on TV more because the government are on less. Yeah. And so, so there is a space to fill, and these, these people fill them, and they become characters. And I just kind of wonder, what, what effect do you think that has on the quality of politics, the quality of government, when, when people can behave in, what, in ways that would have been regarded as outlandish, but, but survive and become more popular Yeah, the old result. rules, the norms have been broken. I, I must say that I think Pondit TV, those sort of things that have been imported from reality TV where everyone is booked for conflict because it's much better if they scream and argue with each other in the Big Brother house than if they all get along. And that was sort of imported onto the kind of daytime magazine show sofas like this morning where they started booking people like Katie Hopkins to sort of say, I wouldn't let my children play with other children with common names and things like that to sort of create this kind of conflict and have arguments because they kind of got lots of attention for the show. But then I think news programmes started, and particularly rolling news, because it's cheap to fill the air, started booking pundits all the time um, who were from quite extreme ends of the, of the spectrum sometimes. You might have someone from the Taxpayers Alliance or someone from right the other end of the spectrum, which doesn't actually represent the kind of, you know, median or whatever of opinion at all. But so many debates, which we didn't even know were debates, became completely polarised. And um, in that kind of environment, someone like Nigel Farage can flourish very well. Um, and people who are willing to say all sorts of kind of slightly fringe things become very bookable. I mean, they were just bookable guests. And I, I think that has really spoilt the quality of debate. It hasn't, it, it's created a lot of conflict and fireworks on news programmes that perhaps don't need it. But I suppose what it's also done though is, is it's brought popular culture and politics closer together. Yeah. And that maybe that's a good thing. Because, you know, yes. because it makes politics more accessible to the mainstream of the population, people who perhaps just wouldn't have bothered, who wouldn't have stayed up for Newsnight. Or... And yet people are switching off from it. And I think that it's, you know... It, Do you think it, they are? Yes, I think I know so many people who just, I just can't face the news, you know. And it's not because of the way that the news is configured or whatever, but it's, it, it's because it's gone on for so long, this kind of hysteria and also... Of course, we can't forget that this has all been supercharged by social media, where there are now five or six news cycles a day, where there used to be kind of one at best. And now, so all these things... And then the later in the afternoon, it's everyone reacting to the thing that went wrong in the morning. And, you know, is there's a big sort of stop the ride, I want to get off quality to a lot of this. And I think I hear so many people who are not connected with the media just saying, I just can't face it all anymore. Explain, explain your desire for privacy. 
oh, I just, well, I, I, I remember reading about 10 years ago that people, you know, young people really just valued connectivity above anything else. And privacy was like down at number 20. I was like, wait, privacy can be lovely. You know, I think that, gosh, the art of mystery and things like that are being lost. And, in the, you know, in the old days, I used to imagine this world happening in London where all the interesting people were doing fantastic things around at each other's houses and, you know, making brilliant conversation at fantastic parties on a Saturday evening. And, you know, now you can just see that they're sitting there tweeting about Strictly. And I think there's something, something of the, mis the mystique has gone. I don't feel the need to know every... I, I mean, I don't really think people... I don't think it ends well for people just putting all this stuff online. There was a trend about, I mean, about 10 years ago, I was quite lucky that this whole Brexit thing happened, I must say, because about 10 years ago, you know, people were, particularly women, always encouraged to write these kind of first-person essays about their pain and whatever. And I used to think, where's the pastoral care for these people? Once it's out there, I always tell young women who come and ask me about journalism, I say, just don't write all your kind of worst stories when you're really young. You may wish to write them when you're older and much more experienced, but don't kind of put them all out there. I don't see all the guys writing about some horrible thing that happened to them after a party. I mean, you know, they're out there trying to write about politics or whatever, you know. I really don't like that kind of tendency to try and make people sort of splurge all their life on online. I think it's a... But, but you sometimes, I suppose, cross that bridge a little bit, don't you? I mean, I saw one Very article, rarely, I don't know whether yeah. it's in the book or not, about, um, about giving birth. Yes, I mean, there, there are, there, very rarely I will do it. And sometimes if I feel that there's a particular thing, point I want to make. But in general, I don't, you know, write about my, but lots of other people do it so brilliantly, by the way. And often, but in general, I think they're the sort of more experienced people who um, can be very careful about what they reveal and what they don't. I'm, I, I've been quite happy to have this soap opera to write about and on it goes. <laughs> So, I mean, well, how, how did you become a journalist? I became a journalist, it, it's awful to say, because it's been giving me a good living, but I, by accident. I, after university, I worked for a secretar secretarial temping agency, and um, I used to get sent most... I actually wasn't quick enough at typing to be secretarial. I am now. But I did... I was a receptionist, so I used to answer the phone, and I did it in every different type of place. Um, and... But I used to hate particularly going to the banks in the city. I always find them sort of awful and the, it was really sexist culture and I hated it. Anyway. What, once, what did you think you were going to do with yourself at that stage? Oh, I you, didn't know. I you didn't, were just filling time. Yeah, I, did, I wasn't sure. And, you know, I, I didn't really have the confidence to have those thoughts, really. I, things didn't seem that I could do them. I, I didn't feel that I could achieve Why? the things. I don't know. I mean, I've I felt mean, you'd gone to more Oxford University, super bright, yeah. great education. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, I yeah, I've I've just grown in confidence over the years, mostly from just trying to keep my head down and fi try and get better at one thing. Um, and now I feel much more confident about all sorts of things. And I'm, you know, doing TV writing now. I'm doing all sorts of other things. But at the time, um, I didn't feel like that at all. I felt. I wouldn't say lost, but definitely not like I could sort of say strike out for a particular career. Anyway, so I was sent by this temping agency, all different places, and I just really couldn't face going back to the bank one day um, that they'd be been sending me to. But they said, if you don't want to do that, there's three days to answering the phone on the bizarre desk, which was the show de showbiz desk at The Sun. And I thought, well, I'm sure they'll hate me with my voice. But anyway, I shall go along. And it was, I had such fun. It was brilliant. I, I mean, it was crazy. It was such an eye-opener. I didn't realise at that point how many celebrities were in the tabloids because they were literally ringing in saying, do you want to know who I'm in bed with? I mean, it, it was mad. It was complete madness all the time. And it was just great fun. It was hilarious. And then I managed to stay on because they needed someone actually for longer. And I just stayed on and stayed on. And I ended up doing the picture research and I ended up doing all sorts of things. So it was really, and isn't that awful to say, by accident that I went into, that I went into it because um, this temping agency had sent me there. And if anyone listens who thinks they don't know what they want to do, I just think, God, it's funny how things turn out and you move a little bit closer to things each time that suit you. And then eventually you might find something, if you're lucky, that kind of keeps you going. But how did you get from answering the showbiz phones to The Guardian? Well, I was actually sacked from the sun, but then I and then I kept, and I don't think anyone really wanted to harm me at all, but the great Matthew Norman, who used to write the diary, um, hired me 
to help him on the diary, which was absolutely brilliant. It was a, about politics, and that really introduced me to the idea of writing about characters every day. We, Matthew was always saying, we don't have anything so ridiculous as stories in this column. We have characters, and we just sort of would bring them back each day and make stupid phone calls, really kind of quite rude phone calls to various people in, I don't know, in number 10 or in the government. Then I ended up doing editing the diary on my own. And then when about a bit more than that ago, 16 years ago, um, I ended up doing a, I went to three columns a week, one which was about celebrity, one which was about sport, and one which was sort of general comment. But funnily enough, I wasn't really very often allowed to write about politics. I say this with great love for my boss, but I wasn't really, they'd always say, Oh, you know, whoever I was with on the same day. How did you crack that? I think particularly around the time of the um, Brexit referendum. And that's when I Because they realised you had something well, to say. Well, I just said, I'll keep writing on this if you don't mind, and I'll just do it every day and just put it online. It doesn't have to go in the paper if not. And then I think, that because a sort of following developed from that, that they then... <laughs> I didn't have anyone telling me not to write about it anymore. Do you think the pace of events means that we don't really take in their seriousness. God, absolutely. There's so, yes, absolutely. It's very, this is why I wish journalists wouldn't waste quite so much time on predicting things, because I think really analysis of the many things that are happening so much gets kind of, as I say, cast to one side because of the frenetic pace of the news cycle or whatever. And we don't spend much time, enough time, dwelling on a lot of things. And, you know, the story of the last decade, to a huge extent, has been in my view, you know, uh, uh, coming to terms with the fact that the financial crisis was the, by far the biggest event of the 2000s. And I think that people thought that 9-11 was, and even at the time, I don't think we realized the ripples and how the financial crisis would play out at all until much, much later. And that, so that should be a sort of cautionary tale in lots of ways. Is that what you think Brexit was down to? The Brexit goes back to the financial crisis? I think part of Brexit and a lot of Trump, yes, I think that the fa failure to reach any kind of moral <laughs> settlement after that was a big, big problem. And people, yes, I do think that that was, I think it destroyed a lot of people's lives and it didn't seem to destroy any of the people who caused its lives. And I think that people felt that there was a kind of a culture of elite impunity. And I mean, I, you know, I tend to agree with them and I can see why people ultimately make decisions to vote in, and to lash out and to just desperately try something different, to desperately try something different, yes. And I can see that we didn't deal with that at all in the right way. So where are we with elite Im impunity now, do you think? <laughs> Still in the same place, if not worse. It blew my mind that Boris Johnson stayed in office, not for just breaking the law, but for breaking his own law that everyone else had had to follow and that he had gone on television every single night to say that it was life or death that you followed this law. This blows my mind. Yeah, it's total impunity. Fine, it did for him in the end. But the fact that he continued to sort of wander around as though this were completely normal is mad. And I just think, yes, elite impunity, I think it's got worse. The other thing that I wonder whether you question is, has this year of politics and political drama meant that we haven't really considered the impact of the pandemic. Yes, I do think that's the case. But one of the big... I really... That book, Failures of State, State by the Sunday Times Insight team, which was such a sort of damning indictment of the whole way, so many different individual decisions taken throughout the pandemic. And what I... You know, it absolutely deserves its title, Failures of State. But what I found most interesting about that book, in a way, was the sort of reaction to it, which I wouldn't say was muted because lots of people thought it was great, but... I think that people, the, the thing that I found most worrying about that is that the British people clearly deserved better, but they didn't expect any better. And that to me is indicative of a country that is in a form of decline. So, so do you have any sense of how, how to turn things around yourself? I mean, do you sit there thinking, if only we did this, if only we did that? Yeah, if only... <sighs> I do think if politicians weren't quite so keen on showing the type of person and being a type of person for the playing to the crowd, then perhaps they would make, I think thinking how they appear in the media is a real kind of disease of this, particularly of this generation of politicians who seem to really mind how they're portrayed. And in the case of Boris Johnson, it just sort of paralyzed him as a decision maker. I think he made decisions very slowly and very poorly and with 
um, his mind on all the wrong things, like how it would look. And, you know, I'm afraid you've got to be, you've got to be a leader. And how long do you think you can carry on in this sort of loop of, of, a, oh, of a nightmare? <laughs> Well, I mean, we're because all that's the other thing you we? think about this. You know, you're going through this period where, you know, as I say, I mean, I, I, um, I mean, when I got this, it took me quite a while to actually oh, God. open it because I thought I don't, yeah. I'm not sure I want to go there. Um, <laughs> Should I say this? I don't it. blame you. Yeah. <laughs> and you're in it. So how, how long do you want to carry on doing it? Well, I don't know. I do other things as well now. So I do some writing for television and things like that, and that's all fun. Just different things. As you know, it's good to do things when you're. It, to make you scared again. So what's the new trade? Tell me about the writing Oh, no, I've just been doing... I've been just doing some writing for co television, just various comedies, and, you know, we'll see we'll see how, how they how they pan out. Some of them have been on and some of them haven't. Which, which ones have been on and which ones... I've, well, the, which ones I wrote I on about? Avenue 5, which is Armando Iannucci's one for um, uh, for HBO, but which is um, the second season of that is coming. And then um, um, there's, I've got a new one of the... the we're filming the pilot, which is sort of behind the scenes on a superhero franchise scene, franchise movie, another workplace comedy. So is this working in a writer's room? Yeah, yeah. What's that like then? Oh, it's really fun, you know. It's really great having other people. It's totally different. And, of course, you know, you do, I mean, tens of drafts of one script, uh, whereas, you know, in journalism, as I say, I've done by lunch, you know. And that's a totally different way of writing and it's t much more collaborative and it's for me it's something totally new so I'm really scared again and worried which is good um I find it it makes you feel a lot younger to do something different in a weird way because I associate that feeling of being nervous and not knowing what I was doing with being younger simply because I've stayed in the same business for a while so being scared again you know I'm definitely going to try and find something when I'm 58 something new to do again to get scared because even though you're much more you know I'm tired because of doing too many things at once I feel kind of rejuvenated by that and it's exciting yeah being in a writer's room is really fun if they're really nice and you know all the ones I've been in have been great what I've never understood about the writer's room is who actually does the writing like how how do 10 people write a joke well it depends how <laughs> it depends how your room works and all of them work in different ways but you might have um you know a few months of all the or a few months or a few weeks of everyone talking and deciding what makes, that makes each other laugh. And then gradually on this whiteboard, it might emerge into a sort of... And then you might individually go away and write your episode. But then it might get, depending on what show you work on, it might get passed around to other people and everyone feeds in. And it's, you know, it goes through so many different iterations before you finally think it's done. Although... Someone said to me the other day that, you know, that, that no, scripts are never done. They're just sort of surrendered to production, which is quite a newspaper -y thing in a way, just that feeling like, I don't care if it's finished, it's deadline, you know. Eventually, at some point, you have to just say, OK, we'll shoot this. We, I sort of started off asking you about, you know, do, you know, are, do, do you think everyone, they're all useless, this generation of politicians? And you, you said this sort of generation of politicians are particularly bad. I mean... I've got something to say on that, which okay. is, aren't we just a bit... Weren't we deceived by the fact of the Second World War to think that actually, you know, think of the politicians in the 19th century, the 18th, you know, these yeah. were awful, largely, by and large, awful. But because of where we came in the timeline, you know, I was born in 1974, but because after the Second World War, so many of these people who'd been forged in the fire of this terrible national event then come through and become politicians. And they've done incredible things, often both in wartime and outside of war, but in business or whatever. And, you know, it's interesting that, and perhaps not surprising, that that would be a period of consensus. And some really amazing people entered into politics. And I think that the calibre now has massively dropped off. Um, I personally would pay MPs more. Um, and... I I think the calibre has really dropped off. And I can see why people just don't want to go into it. And, you know, real kind of oddballs go into it in some ways because the, uh, the nature of the job attracts... I mean, would you want to do it? <laughs> I used to want to do it when I was growing up. You did. I, well, yeah, when I was growing up, ever since I was five, I wanted to go into politics. I thought, you know, I really, really want to go into politics. And when I got to university, um, I joined... Um, the Oxford Union, thinking, well, this is where lots of politicians start out. And I was so shocked when I got there. I just thought, oh my God, these, it's awful to say, 
these people are so awful. I mean, and then I suddenly had this scales from the eyes moment where I thought, my God, you know, I haven't just got a bad crop. This is what like people who are doing this are actually like. And therefore I thought, right, I'm never coming back here. So I spent all this money joining this thing, which I never went to and thought this is just, dr and from and that, that was moment, the end of your political that was ambition. the end of me thinking I wanted to be in politics because I just thought I, this is not at all for me. We must go back and check who your contemporaries were then. <laughs> You're a bit. You're a bit. bit <laughs> well, if some of them it was done a bit quite before well. Jacob Rees-Mogg, I suppose. But yeah, a little he, bit before he was one of Moggy, mine. But yeah, yeah. Some, so you're looking good on it. Uh, he had a hard paper round. I'm joking, of course. Um, he, um, but yeah, uh, yes. So they've done very well. Some of those people. Yeah. So if you could change the world in any way now, yes. What would you do? I would reduce the UK tax code from whatever it is now. I think I would like people to pay their taxes properly. Um, the Hong Kong tax code, which is, uh, I think, regarded as the most like avoidance proof in the whole world, is 350 pages long. Ours is currently somewhere in the mid 25,000 pages long. It's been expanded by both Labour and Conservative governments. Someone who avoids a lot of tax said to me, why do you think they do that if they don't want you to find ways, find ways to get out of it? And I think that people should pay their taxes. I think building tolerance and prosperity, that would be one of the biggest, biggest ways to help make that happen. And I really fear if people just think they can opt out of these things. That's what I really believe in that. I really believe philanthropy starts with paying tax. Marina, hi, thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. You can watch all of these interviews on the Channel 4 News YouTube channel. Please give us a rating or review so other people will find the podcast. Our producer is Freya Pickford. Until next time, bye-bye.